Real quick, before we get started, I wanted to let you know about some things coming up. If you are in the Memphis area or want to make a trip here, registration is open for the Annie Oakley Buffalo Bill Super Sprint and Sprint Triathlon on June 24th. This is a great opportunity to race a fast and fun course. I'll be there as a race official and Josh will BMC, so be sure to come say hi. Another great event, the Dragonfly Triathlon, is coming up on August 26th in Sardis, Mississippi. This race features a fast out and back bike course and a partial trail run. It's another great race put on by PR Event Management, and I'll be at that one too. Also starting up again this year is the Shelby Farms Open Water Swim Sessions. Nearly every Sunday morning until Ironman 70.3 Memphis in October, you can swim in Hyde Lake at Shelby Farms, where both the Memphis and May triathlons and the Ironman 70.3 take place. The cost is $15 per session, or you can swim for free when you volunteer. I'll be there most Sundays, so I hope to see you there. Links will be in the show notes. Picture this. You're halfway through the bike leg of a triathlon, the sun beating down on your back and your legs begging for mercy. Suddenly, you feel a wave of energy surge through your body, propelling you forward like a superhero on a mission. What's the secret behind this superhuman surge, you ask? It all comes down to proper fueling and hydration strategies, my friend, because let me tell you, there's nothing worse than bonking or feeling like a dehydrated raisin in the middle of a race. Today, we're diving into a topic that can make or break your race day performance. So strap on your nutrition belt and get ready for a tantalizing ride through the world of race day nutrition. Time for episode 23 of the official triathlete podcast. Hey, my friend, my name is Danita Jacobs. Some people know me as a nurse, a leader and health expert. Other people know me as a coach, race official and seasoned triathlete. But at the end of the day, I'm simply a friend with a mission. I want to help you transform your life. My goal isn't to help millions. My goal is to help you. Welcome to the official triathlete podcast, where you will learn about all things multi-sport, broken down into bite-sized pieces, and how we can blend life demands with fitness goals. My approach is different because I am blending my 20 plus years of healthcare and athletic experience to help you be the healthiest, happiest, and most balanced athlete you can be. I believe in you, even if you don't. You really can reach those soaring goals, and I'm here to help you get there. I am so glad that you made it here. If you have a question or topic idea, get in touch and let me know. After all, this show is for you. Enjoy! Hello, my friends and fellow athletes. Thanks for tuning in. I'm so grateful that you're here. Before we uncover the hidden treasures of race day nutrition and hydration, I always start with a little message from my Train With Heart program. It's my mission to transform the whole athlete, so heart not only develops and prepares the body for improved athletic performance, but aims to optimize the whole person through healing, empowerment, awareness, reflection, and transformation. So each episode, I share a little snippet from how I help my athletes with one of these elements. Today, we are going to discuss awareness. Now, I'm an avid podcast listener. I don't even know how many I'm subscribed to, maybe 30. I love to learn, and podcasts are a great way to learn a little while I'm doing other things. This is one of the reasons I created this podcast, because I am hoping to do the same for you. I get so much value from the people that I listen to. Well, this morning, as I listened to two of my favorite mindset podcasts, I realized that the messages were very similar and right in line with this week's heart message. What perfect timing. I learned something and I am now going to pass it on to you. So our topic is awareness. And what I listened to was about shattering those unconscious limiting beliefs. How cool is that? We all have limiting beliefs, those deep-rooted ideas that we have about ourselves that we aren't even aware of. Well, we need to bring those to the surface and become aware of them so that we can smash them to pieces. You see, these limiting beliefs, though subconscious, are holding you back from doing great things. Have you ever seen a horse tied to something flimsy? Like, I saw a picture once of a horse tied to a little plastic chair. Horses are big and strong. That horse could have gone wherever it wanted to and just drug that flimsy chair. But the horse had been trained to stay where it was tied up. It had a limiting belief from years of training that when tied to something, it had to stay put. I saw a video not too long ago of a trainer that simply held her arms up as if she was holding a rope that was pulling the horse. She was holding nothing, but the horse was so well trained that all she had to do was pretend she was pulling the horse by a rope, and the horse followed. The horse believed it was being pulled around. What have you been trained to believe? What are those beliefs that you have that are holding you back? What path are you following because you believe you can only follow that path? I heard a story, maybe a metaphor, 
about a man that had these huge elephants tied up to little baby trees, and the elephants just stayed put. When he was asked why the elephants didn't try to move when they are thousands of pounds and strong enough to break those little trees with little effort, the man said that he had those elephants since they were babies, when they weren't strong enough to break away from the trees. The baby elephants had tried, but after multiple attempts, realized that they were just not strong enough and they quit trying. As the elephants grew, they didn't need a stronger rope or a stronger tree because the elephants believed that they weren't strong enough to break away from the tree. They weren't aware of how much bigger they were or how much more powerful they had become. The elephants had been trained to believe that they were powerless and they gave up on trying. Now that's a sad story for so many reasons, but how have you been conditioned to believe that you can't do, insert something here, because your mind thinks you can't, you don't even try. Even as you grow, as you mature, as you get more powerful, there is an unconscious belief that is holding you back from trying. Was there a moment, a circumstance, or an event that happened where you just gave up? Was there a negative event or something you were told? Did someone or some people say things to you that you tucked away and unconsciously believe what they said? Did you try something, put your heart and soul into it, and yet you failed, or at least you believe you failed? And was there a moment that you just gave up? One of these podcasts told a story, but I'm not going to share that one with you. It prompted me to think, and I'm going to get a little vulnerable with you and share mine instead. When I was young, I had a group of friends, well, I called them a group of friends, that told me I was fat and ugly and always would be. Whether or not that was true, I believed it, and I've carried it with me my whole life. Heck, I'm 41, and I still sometimes believe it to be true. Even though I've grown up, matured, and found value in other things besides vanity, that belief has held me back from putting myself out there and doing great things. Believing I wasn't worthy stopped me from getting involved. That lack of belief in myself I was carrying prevented me from even starting this podcast. I wanted to for so long, but I was letting my unconscious limiting beliefs hold me back. Honestly, it becomes our comfort zone, right? So what comfort zone are you living in right now? What limiting belief is holding you back? And are you going to stay in that comfort zone? Are you going to let that moment, that thing someone told you, that idea of yourself that was created, stop you from moving forward? A lot of times we stay in that comfort zone because it's just easier not to try than it is to face it. It's easier not to try than to face all those insecurities. Are you restricted by your own mind? Since this is a triathlon podcast, let me relate this topic to the world of multi-sport. Do you want to run a 5K, but don't believe you can? Do you want to do a triathlon, but don't think you look the part? Are you afraid of looking foolish? Are you afraid of not finishing? Are you intimidated? Are you anxious because you don't know how? What are the self-limiting beliefs that are holding you back? I invite you, my friend, to put some thought into this. Become aware of your limiting beliefs and then work towards crushing them. Allow me to share with you a text message I just received. Standing in your power means having a deep inner knowing that at any moment, you can change the trajectory of your experience. You are the co-creator of your life. You get to create the vision for your dreams, and you get to decide what is and isn't in alignment with that. Heavy stuff, isn't it? Now, before we move on to the main topic, I must mention, if you need a little help with this, guess what? That's exactly what I do. Sometimes we need a little help. Let me help you get past those limiting beliefs. Let me be the person you lean on to move past those fears that are holding you back. Let me be the person that guides you as you do something extraordinary. I know you have some soaring goals in mind, and maybe you just don't know how to get there. Go on over to trynursecoaching.com and sign up for a free 30-minute goal-setting session, and let's chat about those limiting beliefs and get you set up to crush them into tiny pieces. Have you heard that there is a fifth discipline in triathlon? You may ask, what? Five disciplines? Indeed, my friend, there is a fifth discipline. There's swimming, cycling, and running. Do you remember the fourth? Well-executed transitions, right? You have to train for all four parts. Granted, your time will be spent on the main three, but you still have to practice transitions. But there is a fifth discipline, and my friend, it is absolutely pivotal that you train for it. And that is your fueling and hydration strategy. Too often, fueling and hydration take a backseat and athletes just wing it. But I'm here to tell you that you need to put some thought and practice into your race day strategy. And it starts during your training. 
It does not matter what the distance of your race is. Even a super sprint is an endurance event, and you will perform best when you have a good plan in place. Fueling-related challenges are quite common for triathletes. Food tolerance, GI issues, and taste buds are frequent nuisances. Sweat rate, fluid overload, and electrolyte loss are varying challenges athletes face. So how do you properly fuel and hydrate for training and racing? There is a three-part solution. Use your training to practice and determine what works for you. Develop a race day plan and then follow that plan. The crazy thing I see way too often is athletes that develop a plan and then don't follow it. I get it though. Race day comes and you're just not feeling it. Maybe you feel fine. You feel strong. You're not hungry. You're not thirsty. It's too hot to eat. It's too early to eat. It's too cold to drink. Your nerves are making it impossible to consume. Your stomach is upset. You're afraid of too many porta potty trips. That's just naming a few. But whether you're racing a balls to the wall sprint or in for the long haul of a full distance triathlon, your fueling and hydration plan should be specific for the task at hand. Lucky for you, well, for all of us, there is an enormous variety of options. However, that can make what to eat and drink and when get quite complicated and overwhelming. The number one piece of advice that I can give you is to experiment and practice. Okay, well, that's a wrap. Talk to you next week. No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't leave you hanging like that. So I'll say this. Nutrition and hydration are highly individualized. What works for me may not work for you. What works for my friends doesn't always work for me. I had to practice through trial and error and find what I like, what gives me the energy I need, what I can tolerate, and when to consume it. I have a friend that lives on Pop-Tarts. That's breakfast. It's training fuel. It's sometimes post-race refueling. Ugh, I even get a little grossed out talking about it. But that's just me. She loves it. Now, as a nurse and a coach, that is not my recommendation, but it works for her, so to each their own. So let's talk through some things, and I'll interject my thoughts and my strategy along the way. It's important to note that trial and error come with good and bad. That's what it is, trial and error. I have had many errors. Have you heard of bonking? Yeah, it's no fun. And sometimes it's hard to know that's even what's happening. Remember a couple of episodes ago when I told you about going to Madison while training for Ironman Wisconsin? I was with my husband, and I did not have a solid plan in place. My biggest problem was that I had burned through my fuel and I was dehydrated. I just didn't realize it until my husband pointed it out to me. After I yelled, screamed, and cried, of course. I remember another time during some long-distance training that I petered out big time. I didn't lose my temper this time, though. We were on the Tanglefoot Trail, and we're about 70 miles into our 88-mile ride, when all of a sudden, I was riding along, laid over my handlebars in arrow position, and I was literally falling asleep. My eyes were so heavy, and I had no energy. I started falling back. Josh turned back to check on me, and I remember saying to him that I just wanted to go to sleep. Very quickly, he had me stop riding, get off the bike, and take in some calories. I was full-on bonking. So what is bonking? Some people call it hitting the wall. It's a sudden, overwhelming feeling of running out of energy. It almost happens without warning, or at least it feels that way. It's like you're moving along, managing just fine, then bam, legs and arms are cement and you feel an entire body fatigue and you're forced to stop. But what has happened? Basically, bonking is due to a total glycogen depletion from your muscles and liver. Since glycogen is the primary fuel source for endurance athletes, when we've depleted our resources, recovery is hard. You see, our bodies burn through sugar and then dip into the glycogen storage bank. If you are not fueling adequately, your body will use its reserves, leaving you with nothing. Then you're in trouble. How do you prevent bonking? For endurance athletes, carbohydrates are our friend. Some endurance athletes have trained their bodies to sustain themselves on low-carb diets, but the vast majority of us need plenty of carbs for our level of training. A good range for the average athlete's daily diet is to consume about 40 to 65% carbohydrates. Good quality, of course. Another thing is to consume an adequate amount of calories for your body weight. Ideally, you don't want to be in a huge calorie deficit while training. I know so many of us are trying to lose weight. I get it. Me too. I've got some pounds to shed. But when endurance training, it is not the time to heavily restrict. You have to trust the process. It's one thing when you are exercising to lose weight. When you're doing shorter workouts and watching your calorie intake solely for the purpose of losing weight, you can sustain a calorie deficit. 
But when you are training for a purpose, like for a race, you have to fuel your body. Eat before training and racing to top off your gas tank and always replenish your glycogen stores after long workouts. So though it is important to take in carbs, can I just ask that we end the days of heavy carb loading and the major overconsumption of pasta, bread, and other carbs the day before a race? It's really not necessary. Yes, you should have carbs, but a well-balanced meal with a more metabolically efficient fueling strategy is sufficient. Benefits include better energy levels, stabilized blood sugar, elevated performance, and overall better general health. You should take in what you need and not more just for the sake of preloading. Let's start by talking about race fueling in general. Start with a good pre-race dinner. This should be a balanced meal, meaning that all three macronutrients are included. That means you should have a healthy plate of protein, fat, and carbs. I'm pretty boring and just like a simple meal of chicken and rice and maybe add an avocado or some cashews. Sometimes I will have a good protein shake with protein powder, fruits like berries, a banana, half an avocado, chia seeds, and Greek yogurt. Many people have gut issues on race day, so it may be best to avoid high fiber foods. I don't really have any gut issues like bowel problems on race day, but I do tend to avoid vegetables the day before a race. It's also a great idea to hydrate well. Don't drink so much that you're up using the bathroom all night, but stick with water or a hydration drink. It's best to avoid alcohol, but I've been known to have an early glass of wine. Hey, don't judge. In case you're interested in specifically what I use, the protein powder I use is either USANA's Nutrameal or Biotrust. I like to prehydrate with QScience's Q-Twist hydration packets. There are links in the show notes. Some brands are affiliate links, meaning if you purchase through them, I may receive a small commission. But as I say, every time I recommend a product, I only recommend products I use and believe are high quality. Hey, I am a master's prepared registered nurse with a background in research, so I always do my due diligence to ensure that what I put in my body is high quality and research backed. I like to see the evidence. Now on race morning, eat breakfast. This one is hard for me sometimes. I'm just not an early morning eater, especially when we are talking about 4.30 or 5 a.m., but it is important to take in some well-balanced calories a couple of hours before the race so that your body has a chance to break down the food and get it ready to fuel your body. Be sure to eat all three macronutrients so that you avoid energy fluctuations and keep your blood sugar stabilized. I'll typically eat oats with peanut butter and an egg. Start the morning by hydrating too. I start every morning, whether racing or not, with my early bird morning cocktail. It's a yummy drink. My favorite one is the mimosa with clean energy, mood-enhancing nootropics, and it provides supercharged hydration. I replaced my morning coffee with it a long time ago, and I just feel better. I'll have a link in the show notes for that, too. I'll drink a glass of my morning cocktail and a full bottle of water first thing in the morning. For race day, just carry a bottle of water around with you and sip on it all morning long. Don't get waterlogged, but it is a great opportunity to prehydrate. Just before the race, if you can tolerate it, it's a good idea to top off the tank again. Taking in about 100 calories can give you that last little boost to get you started. If you want to stick with natural products, this is a good time for a small banana or an orange. Alternatively, there are plenty of products to choose from. Many people take a goo or a gel. I personally recommend hammer products. For me, though, I usually eat about a half of a honey stinger waffle. And don't forget to drink water or electrolytes. For during the race, we are going to get into more specifics for each race distance. Now for post-race recovery, you'll need to replace lost nutrients. First, start rehydrating. At a minimum, take in plenty of water. It's the first thing I grab after crossing the finish line. Well, after my medal, of course. I'll follow that up with an electrolyte replacement drink, especially at hot races. Then pretty quickly after, you need to take in some calories. It is best to, yet again, take in a balanced snack or meal. You need carbs to replenish your glycogen stores and protein to halt muscle breakdown and begin repair. Some races will have a post-race meal. Enjoy. If not, bring your own snack to buy you some time until you can get a full meal. Pre-made protein shakes are great for this. Now, some races will have crap to eat post-race, like donuts, pizza, and cookies. Go for it and eat a little bit. Enjoy yourself. You just worked really hard and you deserve it. But my advice is to avoid the temptation of overindulging on crap food. Have enough to satisfy the craving and put a little food on your stomach. Then find yourself a more nutritious meal. If they have fruit, like bananas, grapes, or oranges, those are good picks too. 
Now let's talk about each distance specifically. Remember that each person needs to develop their own strategy. You need to find what works for you. Also, consider that weather and other race conditions will impact your race day plan. I'm going to walk through my strategies and what I see others do. For a super sprint and sprint triathlon, I do not need additional calories during the race. I eat a good breakfast and top off my fuel tank right before the race starts, and that is enough to sustain me. Some athletes will take an additional 1 to 200 calories during the race, typically on the bike or at the beginning of the run. The thing about these races is that they are typically pretty fast, but you are still going harder than during training, so you're burning through your fuel at a greater rate. Normally, you are good for a solid hour to an hour and a half of strenuous exercise without replacing fuel. That is, on average, about how long a sprint triathlon will take to finish. However, if you are a bit slower and hovering around the two to two and a half hour mark, no worries. You are a badass for being there, and I am super proud of you. But you may want to take in that one to 200 calories towards the end of the bike, during transition, or at the beginning of the run. For hydration, that is largely dependent on the climate and the athlete's sweat rate. If it is hot, you will want to take in more fluids, but don't be fooled by a cooler weather race and forget to drink anything. You are still sweating and need to replace fluids and possibly electrolytes. Here's a tip straight from the desert. Sip, don't gulp. Take small, frequent sips of water or sports drinks throughout the race to stay hydrated without overwhelming your system. Remember, too, that thirst is not a reliable indicator of hydration. By the time you feel thirsty, you're already playing catch up. So make a habit to hydrate consistently, even if you don't feel like it. For your sweat rate, probably the easiest way to tell how much you're sweating is to weigh yourself before and after a good training session. If you're going for an hour run, weigh yourself before and after and then take notice of the difference. If you lose several pounds of fluid, you'll need to replace more than someone that doesn't even lose a pound. Have you ever noticed how salty your sweat is? An easy way to tell is how salty your skin is after your sweat dries. I personally do not lose a lot of salt when I sweat, but I know people that will have white dust on their skin after cooling down. My husband, you know, is a bike mechanic and takes care of a lot of our triathletes' friends' bicycles. Some of them even need part replacements way more often than others from the corrosion from the salt. It's so interesting. The way I hydrate for a sprint is pretty simple. I carry two bottles on my bike, one with water and one with Gatorade. I use Gatorade because I have trained my body to use it for electrolyte replacement because it's more often than not what is available on the courses that I race. I don't want to be dependent on carrying my own stuff if I can help it. Ironman branded races have Gatorade Endurance, so that's what I train with. I take in most of my hydration on the bike, then on the run I use the water stops to basically just wet my mouth. An Olympic distance, which is typically about double a sprint, will likely require a good strategy. This distance race is going to take the average athlete around three to four hours, which means you will definitely be dipping into glycogen stores. A good strategy may be planning to take in about 100 calories per hour. Since I don't do well with solids while I'm racing, and I can only take so many gels, I drink my calories. I use Hammer Perpetuum and mix up a 300 calorie bottle. This is where having a tri bike comes in handy. I have a water bottle that fits between my aero bars and has a straw sticking up so I can drink while I'm in aero position. I put water in that bottle. Then I carry one bottle with Gatorade in one of my cages, and the other cage has a bottle with the Perpetuum in it. I will steadily sip on all three throughout the bike portion. Then on the run, I do the same thing as on the sprint. I take in enough water at the aid stations to wet my mouth. Seriously, that's all I do. I wet my mouth. Usually, I am very hot by this time, so I'll take a sip of water and then pour the rest on my head to cool down. Added bonus is when the water is ice cold. Talk about a little boost of energy. Heck, on really hot days, when I'm lucky enough to pass an aid station with ice, I have been known to grab a handful of ice and put it in various places within my tri suit. Now, one time during an August race when it was so hot, I shoved handfuls down my one piece tri suit during the run, and then it all ended up down my pants. I had a big wad of ice shaking around in the diaper area of my butt. It was quite comical, but hey, it cooled me off. Wow, I've gotten way off the topic of nutrition and hydration. Hey, a girl's got to do what a girl's got to do to stay cool, though. So this episode is getting kind of long, so I'm going to skip over the half distance. It's not much different than the Olympic distance, except my bottle with liquid calories has, well, more calories in it, like 600 calories, and I'll take in a gel or two during the run. Now, I'll briefly touch on Ironman nutrition and hydration. 
This honestly could take an entire episode. As I mentioned in episode 20, Iron Man is a whole different beast. This is a full day of going hard. Both of my Iron Man races took me about 14 and a half hours to complete. I mean, that's longer than a work day, even longer than a nursing 12 hour shift. So I've been a nurse for a long time, and I can get through a shift with minimal eating. I mean, there's just not enough time. But though nursing work is hard labor, it's not like swimming, biking, and running 140.6 miles. You have to have a detailed plan in place, and you have to follow it whether you want to or not. So I've said before when I race at Ironman, my goal is to finish. I am not looking to be the fastest. I am not seeking a podium spot or qualifications for championship races. It's a long-ass day. So I put systems in place to be as comfortable as I can, and that includes some of my nutrition strategies. This is exactly what I did for my two Ironman races, and is exactly what I plan to do this September when I go to Ironman Wisconsin. By the way, at both of my Ironman events, my Garmin said I burned about 5,000 calories, so keep that in mind as I talk about intake. I'll start the day with a full bottle of water and what used to be coffee, but is now my early bird mimosa. Then I will take in a solid 1,200 calorie breakfast. Yes, you heard me right, 1,200 calories. It's a recipe I created for my first Ironman that is basically an overnight oats mixture with a bunch of good quality stuff like macadamia nuts, peanut butter, cherries, honey, coconut oil, raisins, walnuts, chia seeds, almond milk, the kitchen sink, and so much more. No, I'm kidding about the kitchen sink. But the bottom line is, I start my day with a calorie and macronutrient-packed meal that gives me solid fuel without overloading my belly. I top off with a honey stinger waffle just before the race starts. I'll sip on Gatorade and water all morning. Then I go for a swim. In transition, I try to eat at least a quarter to a half of a peanut butter and honey sandwich. Then I'm out on the bike for the majority of my day. At Ironman, you can pack a special needs bag with supplies for halfway through the bike and run. So I pack a peanut butter and honey sandwich to eat both of those times. On the bike, I have a 1,000 calorie bottle of Perpetuum for both halves of the ride. And I set my watch to alarm every five miles so that I remember to take in fuel and hydration. I also eat bananas at the aid stations. My favorite trick is Ritz crackers and candy corn. Now, before you say gross, I don't take them in together. I love candy corn, so I'll eat a few when I feel like I need a boost and a treat. I eat the Ritz crackers when I need something salty. They just melt in your mouth, which I love because I don't do well chewing while exercising. I take in as much fuel and hydration as I can on the bike, and then I rely on the aid stations for hydration on the run. Wow, now that was definitely a packed episode. The bottom line, don't be tempted to just wing it on race day. No matter the race distance, you're better off with a strategy. Develop your plan during training. It's okay to experiment, test different strategies, and find what works for you. Fueling and hydration can make or break a race, so put some thought into it. There are all kinds of products out there to choose from that make it a little easier to consume the right nutrients. Now, you don't have to go it alone. You don't have to spend tons of money and tons of time trying out different products. I've been testing different strategies for years, and I've helped a lot of athletes find a strategy that works for them. I'd love to help you, too. That's what I'm here for. That's what this podcast is for. But the podcast can only help so much. We are all unique beings with our own needs and likes and dislikes. What works for one doesn't always work for the next. If you would like some help with your fueling and hydration strategy, I would love to help you too. Don't waste all kinds of time and energy trying to find it all out on your own. It can be totally overwhelming to weed through the enormous amount of information out there. Let's develop a strategy together. Go to trynursecoaching.com and sign up for a free 30-minute goal-setting session, and let's see what we can figure out together. You'll be one step closer to mastering race day. All right, my friend, I've gone on long enough. Hopefully, you've gained a little insight and have a little information to begin developing your fueling and hydration strategy. I've put links in the show notes to most of the products that I personally use, so go check them out. Now, race season is upon us, and I know that most of us battle pre-race jitters, so next week... We are going to discuss six techniques to reduce the race day anxiety and calm those nerves. Talk to you then. Bye. That's all for now. Thanks for tuning in. I want to get to know you, so head over to trynursecoaching.com and sign up for a free 30-minute goal-setting session. Love the show? I'd be forever grateful if you left a review and shared the podcast with your friends. And remember, do things that are hard. 